them and say, I want to grab you. And next week, we're going to do water baptisms at the church. Today is an important message. It's kind of a deep message. It's a message that if you've been here for the last 26 years, you've probably heard before. But I believe it's, it's, it's imperative to repeat it periodically because we in the American church are far different from other people. The American church has adopted more religion than they have kingdom. Now, what do I mean by that is you are a dual citizen. Turn to someone and say, I'm a dual citizen. You are here in the United States of America. You're on this planet. You are a physical being and you are a citizen of this country or Pastor Lucy, a citizen of Canada. We're working on that. Okay, let's move on. And, uh, but when you got born again, you also became a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And there's a difference. There has to be loyalty, more loyalty to one kingdom or the other or one citizenship, citizenship than the other. And when you became born again, you became a citizen of the kingdom of God, which means we have the kingdom rules. We have the kingdom government. We have the kingdom blessings. We have the kingdom understanding. We have the kingdom authority. We have the kingdom dominion. All of that is found within the kingdom's book called the Constitution and Bylaws, which is called the B-I-B-L-E. And as believers, we live by law. Yes, we live by relationship. We're saved by grace through faith, lest any man should boast. And we are saved by the love of Jesus. Amen. But the fact is, is that when you get saved, things shift and things change. And the things that shift and change is not only that the spirit of God dwells inside of you, but also that you now have a kingdom who has a king. Every king has a dominion. Every dominion has been governed by laws. All laws are established upon a constitution. And we as the kingdom people live according to the word of God. That is our constitution. And we live according to the laws of the supernatural, the laws of God's word. And we live as children of the most high king. And as a king, he is a good king. He loves us, wants the best for us. Therefore, he shows us in his word how to live. In that, in this year of reformation, I have found that many people have struggled with excess baggage in their life. Many people are carrying their past into their future. One of the things I found is that no matter how well, and how, if you've got too much luggage to get on the jet, no matter how much luggage you got, no matter how well you seem to organize all your excess luggage, no matter how well and how good it all looks, no matter how well you get it, No matter how well you organize it, it is still bulky. It is still something that is going to make you tired. And I've watched a lot of people call themselves believers who walk around tired a lot because they're carrying the baggage from their past life. They're living in what they were, not in who they are. They believe more in where they came from than where God wants to bring them. So they carry their luggage from their past life and try to bring it into their new life. And the problem with that is it's too bulky. It's too heavy. And by the way, he whom the son has set free is free indeed. Therefore, God has not called you to live in your old life. He's not called you to live in the principles of your old life. He's called you to step into the newness of life. He's called you and I to live in victory. He's called you and I to be more than conquerors. He's called you and I to live in the peace of God that passes all understanding. He's called us to live in the health of God. That's our health plan in the kingdom of God. He's called us to live in the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. And many believers are filled with a lot less than joy. Well, are you a Christian? Well, yes. Um. You believe in God? Yes. How's your walk with the Lord? Good. You want to go to church with me? Why would they want to go to church with you? 
They see you go through all your trials, your tribulations, and you act the same way they do. Come on now. You are carrying the same baggage they're carrying. You're having the same problems they're having and dealing with them the same way. And the problem with that is there is no reason. There is no reason for anybody that's unsaved, if they're watching that type of lifestyle, to want to live for Christ. For Christ. And as a believer, we have to address ourselves. And I'm just going to be very honest with you. I've been a pastor now 37 years. I've seen a lot of depressed Christians. A lot of people who struggle with depression. A lot of people who struggle with uh, dealing with how to work through life's problems. And in that, there is always a struggle of them understanding who they actually are. And stepping into where God wants to take them, that no matter what, no matter what's coming against you, if one comes against you, you're going to have to flee seven ways. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible says in John 10, 10, that Jesus gave us life and life more abundant. That's not how most Christians, that's not how most Christians live. So the issue is not what Christ has said. The issue is not our constitutional rights. The issue is not you and I being believers. The issue is not even you and I going to heaven. The issue is, as they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, and he made this statement. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy what? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Religion is always trying to get you to heaven. But understanding the covenant rights of God, our job is to bring heaven to earth. Our job is to let the world see that God is good and not bad. That greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You and I are supposed to live victorious Christian lifestyles. Not walk around depressed and always sad and always struggling just like the world is. Man, the, the prince of peace, the God of hope dwells inside of every one of you. And we must address this thing called old baggage, this baggage that people struggle with called depression. We must deal with it. So today we're going to. And one of the things that I love about this topic is it's not preaching on depression to make you depressed. It's preaching on depression to show you that you have the right to be free. For he whom the son has set free is free indeed. What does indeed mean? That means without question, without anything being tethered from your past, without anything being carried into your future. It's time to recognize that when Jesus came into your life, you are a new creation in Jesus. Old things are passed away. All things become new. That the Bible says in John, uh, Romans chapter 6, that you now have the newness of life, a fresh start. You see, yes, we all came from the background of sinners. We were all sinners that were saved by grace. But now that you're saved by grace, now you're a citizen. Now it's time to start living differently for the glory of God. Say amen. As a believer, this is who we are. And that's the problem. You've got to start believing who you are. When we start to believe who we are, then it doesn't matter what weapons formed against us. It can't prosper. When we actually start believing who we are, no matter what trial or tribulation, it cannot suck us into the whirlpool called depression, but we're going to be able to stand even in the midst of the trial and tribulation, in the midst of that tornadic wind set that would normally destroy us, and we'll stand there, and after we've done all we can do to stand, we will stand there for in the power of his might. As believers, we've got to start believing the Bible. Say amen. Turn to someone and say, believe the Bible. Believe the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says this, For God has not given us the spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Turn to someone and say, I got a sound mind. If you're watching online, type it right in the comment, I got a sound mind. In fact, why don't you all grab your phones real quick? Why don't you all share this on your Facebook page? Everybody knows somebody who struggles with depression, and today is their day to be free. Say amen. I've been praying. I've been declaring the word of the Lord over this message, and I know that God is going to anoint this to set the captives free. I'm going to prove to you, first of all, that depression does not belong in your life. 
Now, the problem is, is what you believe, how you perceive is what you believe. So if you believe that depression belongs in your life, you will embrace it when it comes. And there are many in the Christian world that have embraced depression. They've embraced, embraced the, the sensation of going into the whirlpool and falling into a place where they're losing their hope. And as a Christian, that is not your lot. That is not your that is not the meat from the Father's table for your life. Depression is not of God. Say this out with me out loud. Depression is never the will of God for my life. I'll prove it to you. In the garden, in the garden of Eden, which is the manifestation of heaven on earth, I want to remind you why God created the earth, why God created the tangible the intangible kingdom was always there. Angelic beings were always there. When Satan got cast out, the demonic was there. All of the eternal is already there. And God had a desire to create the natural world so that he could show heaven in the natural world, not just in the eternal. And also to create mankind or create those in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they would worship him out of spirit and truth. John chapter 4, verse 24. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God created us on this earth and he gave Adam and Eve the Garden of Eden. What I love about the Garden of Eden, it is the manifestation of heaven on earth. Now, isn't that what God calls us to do? Christianity is always trying to get everybody to heaven. But kingdom mentality is bringing heaven to earth. We are to show heaven here. Why? Because God dwells inside of you. This is not about you and I being religious folk. Because there are a lot of religious folk that are never going to make it, make, it, make it into heaven. What makes you and I different, what makes a believer go to heaven, is that they recognize and have received the blood of Jesus to wash away their sin. And when they do that, they become the citizen of heaven. And then as citizens, we have rights. As rights, we've got to live within the laws. As laws, we have the right to declare that the word of the Lord is our life, is our bid, is what Jesus paid for, and we can live in that realm. Can I hear an amen? amen. There was no depression in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says, as we know, that God's presence was always there. In Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. Where there is fullness of joy, there is no depression. We also know that Jesus was not depressed. Well, he was God. No, he was Jesus of Nazareth. He was all God and all spirit in the same body. But according to, according to Philippians chapter 2, he gave up all of his heavenly glory to come down here and live as a man. Which means this is that Jesus was a Messiah. Jesus was a savior that understood, according to the book of Hebrews chapter four, he understood all that we are going through as, as he's sitting at the right hand of the father making intercession for us. He can understand how to pray because he saw, but yet he didn't have to participate. Someone once told me, well, you know, I've got to go through drug addiction so I can minister to those that are dealing with drugs. That's not true. Say Amen. Well, you know, I got to do this sin so I can understand people that go through that sin. That's not true. The very nature of sin is all you got to recognize and understand. And Christ was not depressed. So there was no depression in the Garden of Eden. Jesus himself was not depressed, even though he had the ability to be depressed if he had chosen to be. But also when we get to heaven, according to the word of God, the presence of God, the very glory of God, there is no sun because God's presence is the sun that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. He will wait. There will be no tears in heaven. There'll be no sorrow and sorrow in heaven. There'll be no depression in heaven. Why? Because we're going to be in the fullness of his presence. So every one of these things shows us that depression should not be part of the believer's life because the kingdom of God is where? Within you. So as a believer, you and I do not have to be depressed. Now I'm going to say this straight up. Everybody has dealt with depression at some level. The issue isn't that the bird isn't going to fly around your head. The issue is, are you going to let it nest in your hair? 
The issue isn't that you're not going to be tempted to be depressed. The issue is, will you choose to allow that to own your life? You see, as a Christian, as a believer, we've got to make conscious decisions because we have the ability, not like the world. The world does not have the ability to deal with depression outside of just psychology. But as a believer, we have the Holy Spirit. We have God himself dwelling inside of us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we have the ability to live differently than the people of the world because we have the word of God and because we are citizens with citizens' rights to step into the fullness of God and to understand that the joy of the Lord is our strength. As a believer, we've got to understand that depression, and we've got to believe this, that depression is not part of our lives, that we will be tempted with it, but we do not need to submit to it. Say amen. What is depression? It is a mental state categorized by a pessimistic sense of inadequacy and a despondent lack of activity. Sad feelings of gloom and inadequacy. You see, the fact is, is that just the, the, the very description of what depression is automatically shows you it's not God's will. Amen. Just the description of what depression is. It is against the word of God. So it's not that it's not there. The choice is, are you going to make it your God and submit to it? Or are you going to have victory over it? Now, this is very real to me because this came to my doorstep. Everyone always says, well, you know, your personality doesn't bring you to, to be a person of dread. It has nothing to do with your personality. Some of, the, some, of the greatest, some of the greatest comedians on earth killed themselves. Some of the wealthiest people on earth took their own lives because they were depressed. This has nothing to do with money. This has nothing to do with personality. This has to do with the yielding. And I remember when Rhonda died. So here it is, 32 years of living with a woman, 32 years of loving a woman, and now she's dead. I have a man attacking me, trying to destroy this ministry, trying to destroy my reputation. And then we have COVID, all in the same bundle. And I'm sitting there, and I remember talking to the Lord. I used to walk in my living room in Aaron, and I'd walk around that hardwood floor and just pray and seek God. And I'd, at times I would say, Lord, I don't understand why all this is happening to me. I don't understand. But this I know, that God, you are faithful. That God, you are good. That God, I have seen too much to doubt. That Lord Jesus, you have been my Savior for a long time. You've always been faithful to me. You've always been there. Even though I don't understand this motion. Even though I don't understand this situation. I've got this confidence in you. That I'm going to worship you even in the midst of my lowest point. I'm going to call on your name. I'm going to worship your name. I'm going to declare your goodness. And God, I've watched you too many times deliver me out of the hand of the fowler. So I declare that you're going to do it again. Amen. Say amen. amen. But I had the choice. I had the choice to curl up in a ball. I had the choice to give up. I had the choice to say, no, nah, this is way too much. We have to make choices. And in making choices, we have to make decisions that I am not going to tolerate depression. What you tolerate, you embrace. What you embrace, you coddle. What you coddle, you start talking to. And then you start living with. If you embrace or allow depression to be part of your life, then what's going to happen is it's going to try to own your life. And you can't allow it. Now, if you're here this morning and you're dealing with depression, great, you're in the right place. And I'm going to cover three main reasons for depression. Because there are three main reasons, not just one reason. Every Christian loves to blame the devil. Well, the devil. That demon. No. Nope. Most of the problems with depression have very little to do with the devil. The only time the devil really steps in with depression is when you open the door for him. 
And so I want to talk about three areas that cause depression. The first one I want to talk about is I want to talk about, uh, I want to talk about medical reasons. Now, how can you know if you're stepping into depression? There are certain symptoms that can be identified. Number one, social withdrawal is very common. Or being very social, but when you step away, the fakeness falls off and you go into depression in your car. Aloneness, even in the middle of a crowd. Emotional sadness and frequent crying spells are common. Self-esteem and self-confidences are low. Loss of personality, a sense that our sense of humor has left. Oversensitivity to emotionally. The desire to give up. The sense that nothing is worth it anymore. No hope. All of these symptoms that I just spoke that help identify whether you're struggling with depression or not, every one of them are opposite of the Bible. So automatically, you know that depression is not biblical. And if it's not biblical, it's not your property. And if it's not your property, it's not your lot. And if it's not your lot, stop petting it. And it's time to be free. Now, the first one dealing with the medical, and there are people that have medical issues. There are medical issues that are very real that bring people into depression. And I want to talk about them because I believe they're important. Low levels of serotonin, which is your neurotransmitter, which is like the oil to your brain. It helps keep everything flowing well. You know that foggy feeling? When your serotonin is low, people start malfunctioning in their brain and begin to a physical descent into depression. So making sure, and this is what I love about God, God created our bodies amazing. And our bodies need to be taken care of. Something changed in America. <laughs> well, a lot of things changed in America. Let's just talk about, you know, physical stuff. It wasn't that many decades ago that all of your food was acquired within a 50-mile radius. That the cows weren't being fed certain chemicals to grow quicker with the chickens. That you were not having pesticides saturating all your vegetables. The other night, Pastor Lucy asked for a snack. And uh, she asked for an apple. So I got up. That will remind you that we're in the month of March, um, back when she wanted this. So I went out and I got an apple out of the fridge, a nice red apple. I peeled it. She says, make sure you use the carrot peeler. <laughs> so I peeled it. I, I, I did that little slicer thing that has the decorer. It was beautiful. Then I made sure there was no cores in there, and, and it, was, it was done right. And I took a glob of peanut butter, glory to Jesus, put it on the plate, brought it out to her, and she started eating it. And all of a sudden, within minutes, I see her doing this. <sighs> She's trying to pop her ears. And her, she started having an anaphylactic, anaphylactic, is that what it's called? That kind of thing, where her throat started to swell. And I said, all you need is eat an apple. <laughs> but what it was, there's nothing wrong with the apple. It was wrong with all the chemicals that were on the apple. She usually peels it so that she doesn't get all those chemicals because her body reacts to those chemicals. But yet it must have permeated the, 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 the peel and got into the actual apple. How do you think it's red in the month of March? So here we are, she's eating these chemicals and her body's negatively reacting to these chemicals. That's just, listen now, they say some of the most dangerous, <laughs> the most dangerous vegetables you can eat is spinach. Because all the chemicals that are on there. We live in a very different world. And whether you recognize it or not, we're not getting the vitamins that we're supposed to be getting. And we're getting chemicals that we're not supposed to be getting. Now, I just, we just came back from uh, an Italian wedding, my first one. They feed, man. They feed you. 
And the, the reception went from five o'clock in the afternoon. I left at 10, she says. Uh, she finally made it to the, to, the, to the room at midnight and they weren't done. Whew. They brought out more courses after I left. I'm sitting there, wow, that's a lot of food. But she has relatives, she's from, her family's from Naples, and she has relatives, and they go over to Italy, and they eat the same foods we eat, and don't gain a pound. They eat late at night, everything we're not supposed to do. They eat pasta, they eat all the other stuff, and they don't gain weight, why? Because they're not putting the same chemicals in their, come on now, in their food, that Americans are putting in their food. I don't know when the last, this is not a nutritional seminar. <laughs> but I don't know when the last time you looked at Canadian ketchup compared to American ketchup. Canadian ketchup, is it three or five? Canadian ketchup has three ingredients. American ketchup, Heinz, has a list and names you can't even pronounce. We can't understand why our bodies are not acting normal. There are people that are struggling with depression because you're not eating properly. You're not taking care of your body. Sugar is poison. I love sugar. I just love sugar. <laughs> it's so bad. I mean, I really do. I love sugar. I mean, sugar is beautiful. This is why they put donuts up on the altar. Pastor, will you remember to do the announcements only if you put a donut up there? And you can see there's a bite out of it. And I want to lie and say I didn't bite it, but that would be a lie and I'd go to hell while I'm preaching, and it's not good. But our bodies are not being treated right. You can't eat McDonald's and wonder why uh, uh, a long period of time. I had McDonald's the other day, and I, I made it out of the bathroom, but not far. <laughs> Our bodies were made to be fed well, and we were made to eat good so that we would have the right vitamins and minerals. And when they've done studies, when they study the people's body that struggle with, with depression, some of them have an underactive thyroid. Some of them have vitamin deficiencies, which is B, C, uh, magnesium, iron, and zinc deficiencies. We then deal with genetic, biochemical, and chemical imbalances which are essential fatty acid deficiencies, adrenal gland exhaustion, physical reactions to stress and anxiety chemically being released in our body. We spike in depression because we deal with situations that we aren't dealing with properly or biblically. And then all of a sudden, there's a terminology that's come out because of that, which is called mental illness. There's without question that we're dealing with and it's real. Chemical imbalances now are real. There are people that have been struggling with this and they go on medication. And listen, now I'm not speaking against medication in any manner. Anything that thwarts sickness is good. But I will tell you that I was in Friendly's back when it was open. I was in Friendly's having breakfast one day and a lady came up to me and she said, she was our server and we're there enough to where she knew my name and I knew hers and she said, you know, pastor, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting ready to go get my appendix out. And I said, okay. She said, yeah, they gave me antidepressant medication. So when I go into the operation, I don't get depressed. I said, well, what is, what is taking your appendix out have to deal with, with, uh, with an antidepressant? Listen, we've got to recognize that if we don't deal with these things properly, we're all going to be on medication. We actually started a church one time in another town and we were there for one whole year and there was not one person in the entire congregation that was not on antidepressant medications. Now I want to say this being very clear. Don't get off the anti-medication, antidepressant medication without going to your doctor. You know when the, some of the side effects are suicidal thoughts. Well, you should not get off without your doctor walking you through. But the fact is this, is that many people that are physically dealing with depression, it's because you're not eating properly. You're not taking care of your body properly. There are problems within your physical person, and you need to address that. Don't just cover it up 
address it. Now, we have folks even in our congregation that have gone to war and they've had PTSD. I'm not saying that in any manner. I am not demeaning anybody that's on anti-depressive medications. But what I am saying is this. If you're, if you're depressed because you're physically not well, then get physically well and get off the drugs. All two of you said amen. Yes, I know. This is, this is a topic that makes people very angry. Makes people angry because some people like to be depressed. It validates them. It gives them the attention they need. But I'm here to tell you, God did not create you to have to use antidepressant medications. If you need it, use it. But the fact is, is you shouldn't be using something that you stay on. So learn how to get healthy. Say amen. amen. I started using Kelly's uh, magic stuff. What is that stuff, Kelly? I see you. What is in that stuff? Yeah. What is it? Turmeric, which tastes disgusting. <laughs> Ginger, honey, now it tastes good. Black pepper <laughs> and pineapple tea. I take that every single morning. <laughs> but it's helped me. It helped me. You got to recognize that if you're not getting good food, you're not getting and taking things properly, your body reacts negatively. And for some, especially if you're dealing with thyroid issues, it can draw you into a place of depression. And God wants you to know clearly, if you're physically ill and depressed, God wants to heal you. Amen. That that is not, does not have to be the rest of your life. You're awful quiet this morning. The next reason for depression, which I believe without any question after being pastoring for 37 years, being the number one is what I've seen, is stinking thinking. Whether you like it or not, you are how you think. And that's biblical. Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks... So he is. As a man is, so he talks. As a man talks, so he aims. As a man aims, so he hits. You see, many people that are depressed is they talk themselves into their own depression. And what I have found over the decades is that people that are born again, when they talk themselves into depression, they make that problem their God and focus rather than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who can fix it. So those that are dealing with stinking thinking, we've got to understand that we've got to arrest our minds. The Bible says you have the mind of Christ. The Bible says that you and I can think like Christ thinks. This is why he's told us to read the Bible. This is why the Bible is alive, quick and powerful and sharper than any towards its sword, piercing to the dividing of the soul and the spirit and the bone and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. You see, this is why the Bible is so powerful in your life. This is why the enemy works so hard to keep the Bible out of your life. Because when a problem arises, when a situation comes that is valid and real, that is overwhelming and overcoming, you have to make a decision that I am not going to focus on that. I must deal with that. That is reality. I'm not called to be a liar. If I got snot running down my face, God didn't tell me that I, you can't run around saying I'm not sick. If you got snot running down your face, you got a problem. He didn't call you to be a liar. But the truth trumps facts. Amen. We are to live by the truth of the word of God. It's the truth that makes you free, not the facts. But what happens is many people that talk themselves into depression is a problem comes, like I did, all three of those things at one time. I had to make a conscious choice. I had to think on these things. The Bible says, and is very clear concerning it. The Bible says, take into captivity every thought and imagination that would raise itself up above God. Why? Well, because situations are very valid. 
overwhelming. It can be real. And we've got to make a decision that, as I did in that day in that living room, that, yes, my problems are real. Yes, Rhonda is dead. Yes, this man is doing everything to destroy me. Yes, I, I'm dealing with the COVID and I have to make a decision whether I want a $15,000 fine every time I preach the gospel behind the pulpit and go to jail for a year. I have to make these decisions. I'm sitting there, I'm standing, walking in, walking in my living room. And I chose to say this, God, I don't understand it all, but this I know, you are good and I will worship you. I could be in the lowest of prisons, but I'll still lift my hands and declare, you are a good God and greatly to be praised that you have never failed me yet, even though I don't understand it all, you are faithful. And in that, I made a decision that I was not gonna allow depression to take my life. How do you think when problems come in your life? What's the initial thought? Failure? Loss? We all get discouraged, but there's a difference between being discouraged and depressed. Discouragement is, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? But what happens is if you start staring at what your problem is, it keeps getting larger and larger and larger, and God gets smaller and smaller and smaller. You end up bowing your knee to your problem and making your problem your God. Then standing up and saying, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. My God is good. My God is faithful. I'm going to call upon the name of the Lord and I'm going to be saved. I'm going to stand. And after I've done all that I can do to stand, I'm going to stand there for in the power of his might. I'm not going to move to my right hand and my left. I'm going to lean in and let God do his job. Every one of us makes those choices. But if you and I focus on the problem, that is what we're focusing on, and we can't change it, then it's going to bring us to a place of hopelessness. And hopelessness is a place that depression lives. That is your open door. You can never get to the place that God has lost his power in your life. See, this is the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. A non-Christian does not have God. They only got what they got. And let's be honest, how many of you screwed your own life up once? Twice? Three times? How many of you are still screwing it up today? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> if you could control your own life, you would. But you can't. So why is it that we try to extract the one who can help us to try to be the one in control and lose hope and start getting depressed. You know, that's why whenever I'm in a financial crunch, I always sow more. If I can't fix it, God can, I'm sowing for it. I've had times where I couldn't make a bill and I sowed the money for the bill to the kingdom and God always came through. I stand in today and I want you to know that God is always faithful. You do not have to go into depression by the way you think. You must take your thoughts into captivity. You must think the word of God. I'm going to end with this, this section. <laughs> this is a three-week message that I'm preaching in one week. Remember what the great sin of Adam and Eve was. We always think it's the fruit. The initial portion of the sin was that Eve opened a dialogue with the devil. She allowed Satan to tell untruths and she agreed with what God did not say. That led her to take the fruit. Stop agreeing with the devil. Stop agreeing with your problem. Stop agreeing with your thoughts. Stop agreeing what your feelings are. Your feelings are just feelings. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, and God will always come through. Why? Because your success, excuse me, his success is dependent upon yours. So if you fail and you've done it God's way, then he's failed and his name gets no glory.
Your success is rack and pinion, and it plays a large part in the kingdom. The last part I want to talk about is demonic depression. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, don't give place to the devil. There are people, and this is important for you to know, very rarely does the devil come and play in your room. There's very few people that are that important that Satan's showing up to your house. Now, it's not that demonic spirits won't show up, but remember, don't give place to the devil, or the Bible says, don't give a foothold to the devil, simply means this. And that is that the devil doesn't usually come and play in your playground until you invite him. Demonic depression is when you have opened the door to demonic activity in your life. What does that look like? That means you've extracted the voice of God and you've invited the voice of the liar. That's why it's so important to say, I refuse to allow, I refuse to allow any other voice besides God's voice to echo in my ear when I'm dealing with a problem. The devil's job is to destroy you. And he's good at it. He's been practicing for decades. Excuse me, thousands of years. Which is a lot longer than a decade. He knows man. And so what he does is he waits for you to get to the place where you start losing hope and you've opened the door. Then he slides on in and he goes, yeah, you see, you're never going to do this, man. Yeah, you're going to lose. Yeah, there is no hope for you. I'm going to tell you this straight up. Ready? If you're ever contemplating suicide, it is never God. Human nature in and of itself is to always survive. That's just human nature. And Jesus came that you might have life and life more abundant. Suicide is not life abundant. Somebody said to me, well, you know, pastor, does everybody that commits suicide go to hell? And this is what I tell them all the time. I don't know. And you know what? I just think it's too risky to try. Not only that, it's mean to the living. There are no answers. You never make a temporary decision that has eternal consequences. But the demonic will always push you. There is no hope. You've got nothing left. Nobody really cares about you. If you're gone, no one will even notice. Man, it's, they're better off if you're gone. All those voices are not the voice of God. They're opposite of the word of the Lord. And you must make a decision that I will not entertain the devil, that I will not allow that spirit to speak in my ear, but I will stand and I will declare the word of the Lord. I have all authority over the power of the devil and I will not allow you to speak in my ear. There's not one person here that hasn't had that voice whisper in your ear. The choice is who you're listening to. The playground of the devil is your thoughts. The open door for the demonic are your thoughts. Remember, as you think, you speak. They don't know what you think. They only know what you say. So what you do is you invite them to come into your life by your verbs, your words. So you guard what comes out of your mouth. Just because you think it don't mean you should be saying it. Just because you feel it doesn't mean it's actually valid. Don't give the devil a foothold. Don't allow him to whisper in your ear. Don't allow him to have prominence in your life. You must learn how when you get attacked by the enemy, when there's an open door, to shut the door and also to start declaring the word of the Lord over your situation. And if you're too weak to do that, that's okay too. That's what the body of Christ is for. There's always somebody that's in this room that will take time and pray with you, encourage you, and strengthen you, and empower you, and pray over you. Man, you don't have to do this alone. We are the family of God. You're not out there just making it, but God can propel you. There's somebody in this room that wants to take time, that has authority, and wants to walk you through your victory. Say amen. As a Christian, depression, no matter whether it's physical, no matter whether it's stinking thinking, or whether it's demonic, 
It is not God's will for you ever to be depressed. But I am, Pastor. Does that mean that I'm a bad person? No, that means you, you get to be free. That means God desires your freedom. That means it's time to say, ah, I know what I'm feeling, but I know what I'm getting. I, I understand that my problems are real. I understand my situation is valid. I understand that most people would go into depression, but I am a son and a daughter of the Most High King. I live according to the principles of the Word of God. I am God's child, and God is my hope. God is my peace. God is my joy, and there's nothing impossible if I only believe God can make those things which are turned for bad to turn for good. God is able, and He's on your side, not against you. God is for you. No matter where you are, no matter if you get attacked in any of those areas, I want you to know today that God has a plan to free you. If it's physical, God wants to heal you. If it's thinking, thinking, then you got to respond to the conviction. Or maybe you're not sure what the Bible and the word of God says. You need to join rock solid faith. If it's demonic, you can be delivered in seconds. There are times I've been driving down the road. <laughs> and if they actually, you know, people watch you. Anybody ever watch anybody else while they're driving down the road? I do, especially at stoplights. <laughs> and they see me in the name of Jesus. You know, they can't hear you. In the name of Jesus, I bind that devil in Jesus' name. And they, they think you're out of your mind. But you're actually in your mind. You're actually positioning yourself for success. You can't be ashamed. We live in a spiritual world. We forget that. We become so temporarily motivated that we forget that everything is eternal. The Bible says it this way. Don't look at the things which can be seen, for they are temporary. But look at the things which cannot be seen, for they are eternal. And depression is not part of your lot. Abundantly above all you could ask or imagine. That's pretty stinking good. But if you don't believe it, you can't lay hold of it because your faith will only be projected to what you believe in. So if you believe you deserve to be depressed, you'll be depressed. If you believe that no one loves you, you'll actually convince yourself that that's true, even though it's a lie. If you, if you sit back and you say, I can eat 500 hamburgers and it won't affect me, well, you're lying to yourself. You're going to blow up. We are smart people. Say amen. amen. Turn to someone and say, you are a brilliant human. And in that, we've got to make a decision that no matter what face depression shows itself in, that you are not going to entertain it. Again, I'm going to say one more time. If you're on medication, don't you go off. Some of the side effects are suicidal thoughts. I, I will never understand that. Why you're on a medication to not commit suicide that could make you commit suicide. I don't understand that. Not all of them do that, but that doesn't make sense to me. So go to the doctor if you, if you believe God and want to, you know, and ask, can I wean myself off? Here's the problem with those that have been on antidepressants for a very long period of time is the reason you went on is because you couldn't handle the scene, the scene going around you. You were overwhelmed by that scene. You're still going to have to learn how to handle that scene once you get off the medications. So don't extract yourself from the people of God. Get around the people of God. Get around people of faith. Get around people that will secure you and help you and build you, speak life into you and not death into you. And you'll learn how to live a successful walk with God as a child of the Most High King and not have to live depressed. Today, you have authority over depression. Some of the people that I've seen, the biggest smilers are the ones that go home and cry for hours. They're depressed, but they fake it in, in public. You need to be real with yourself and make this decision. I will not cuddle 
with depression. It will not be part of my life. I choose to be free. Amen. I said, amen. amen. Bow your head with me this morning. Today, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I want you to know that you don't have power over depression. If it's demonic, you don't. And I want you to know today that Jesus has a great plan for your life. His great purpose for your life. That you are not an accident. That you're not just a survivor. That you're not just letting some things happen and then someday you're going to die and no one's going to... I'm telling you right now, you are that fearfully and wonderfully made human. God planned you for this time in history. God needs you and God has greatness for you. He has, he has the blessing of God that will chase you down and trip you up. He has the joy of the Lord that will be your strength. Even in the midst of the greatest trial, you can have that smirk that says, I'm an overcomer in Jesus' name. Today, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, but you want to be part of the kingdom of God, you want to have God's promises, you want your sins washed away, if that's you, I'd like you to raise your hand up this morning. I'd love to lead you to Jesus. I'm not going to ask you to join a church. I want you to know God so you can live in victory and overcome depression. Is there anyone in the room this morning? I'm not going to wait long. Five, come on. Four, three, come on, get your hand up. Two, last call. Thank you, sir. See that in the back. Put it right back down. And last call. And one. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come to the front of the altar. There are some of you struggling with depression today. And you need freedom. Please don't let your pride keep you from prayer. Well, somebody's got to know, who cares? Who cares what people know? Your freedom is for you, not for them. And man, you need to be free from that anyways. You need to be free from what people think about you after a while. You got to stop. You got to stop caring what people think about you. You got to start thinking what God cares about. Today, I'm going to have you come if you're struggling with depression in your life, whatever level, whether it be physical, God needs to heal you. Whether it be, whether it be stinking thinking, God wants to deliver you. Whether it be demonic, God wants to deliver you. And these people have been trained to move in the power of God. Let's all stand to our feet. The individual that raised their hand in the back, I'm going to ask everybody in the room to be brave. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, if you raise your hand, I'll go up with you to the front. Can you ask them that real quick? Don't assume they're going to heaven because they've been coming to church for a while. If you're online, you can look at the number that's on the screen. You can dial that and uh, send a text. I am saved and someone's going to reach right out to you or go to our website, histabernacle.com and we'll make sure that, you, that someone gets right in touch with you because we want you not only to start this race, but finish this race. If you raise your hand and you want Christ to be your Savior, if you'll meet me right down front right now, real quick, just meet me right down front. Be brave, step right out of your chair, meet me right up front. Listen, you got to care, don't care what anybody says. I'm not going to beg, here we go. Father, I just pray for those that, that individual that raised their hand in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you overwhelm them that God, they'll ask you to be their Lord and Savior, and that they'll run this race all the way to the end. In Jesus' name, Lord, love them, bless them, show them how important they are to you. Transform them from the inside out from this day forward. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. I love you. Listen now, next week we're going to speak on anxiety. If you know anybody dealing with anxiety, you want them here. Make sure you bring them. Can you also do me a favor? Can you share this message on your Facebook with folks that you know are struggling with this issue. They deserve to be free and free indeed. Amen? I love you. If you need prayer, make sure you make your way to the front. I love you. Have an awesome day in Jesus. Say.